days before it was adopted in uh, 2007, we, I was trying to explain, well, we already had this study that the district did back in 1999. They hired Post Buckley, Schumann, and Durgan, an engineering firm, to do a very voluminous study. I have those, but they're the only copies I could ever find. They're very thick, and I took characterization of the estuary watershed, a very detailed characterization of this watershed. In fact, they outlined all of the eight major basins of the watershed and then this 186 sub-basins. And each one of these 186 sub-basins, they detailed out what the land use, what the drainage, what all those situations were happening in these watersheds. And I said to the district and to DEP at the time about PMAPs and TMDLs, I said, we already have this. And in fact, they identified those red dots those identified the top 10 that were contributing to the pollution. I said, let's just go in those sub-basins and work with those people to help stop the pollution. So it, it carried on to look at, here's one close up, this is the C44 basin. So when we think of, there's the lake with input off to the left, it's kind of hard to determine, and then the S80 out here to the right. But there's 31 sub-basins that enter into. And most of the time, if you drive out 76, you'll see little spillways that come in. That's the drainage off of there. There are also 25 pump stations along the canal that actually pump water out for irrigation in all of the uh, surrounding, mostly primarily agriculture. So here are those top 10 secondary uh, sub-basins that I mentioned for total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and TSS stands for total suspended solids. And all that left, that silt sediment you see and, and Jackie's uh, aerial photos, Jackie Nitz aerial photos, that's the total suspended solids. It's a silt setup. So there's where the top 10, and I said, you know, why can't we just go work on that? Those guys and help those. There's top 10 right there identified years ago. The district also has done, done other kind of work to identify, uh, you know, the averages and things. These are a period of record, 1995 to 2005. And it shows you each of the sub basins and how they're loading in both metric tons for phosphorus and also for nitrogen. And, but they don't really look at the lake too much, but the, the lake, which I circled, over a thousand metric tons of, nit of nitrogen coming in is the largest inflow of nitrogen to the St. Louis Yachty. So I'm focusing on the, on the watershed, works efficient for something. Also, we can't ignore that the lake is the largest contributor uh, to our estuary flow and uh, out of all these basins. Last uh, July 10th, uh, Stuart Van Horn with the district staff did a great job in describing to the board at our workshop about, about, the, about our watershed. As you can see, mostly primarily agriculture in use, the, the green area, and the natural areas which are in Alapad and some other areas are, you can see there. And then the non-agricultural uses, uh, primarily in the tidal basin, or that gray area that you see that's around the cities, the communities, Port St. Lucie, all those areas that are around in this uh, watershed. So that are what we call the tidal basin or the coastal, uh, coastal part of the watershed. So what he did to help us to understand was what are these uh, land uses, but also what are the uh, water quality inputs. There are about uh, 46 different monitoring stations the district uses. And as you hear Gary go for it tonight, we all talk about using the data. They have collected some of these sites for more than 30, 40 years of data. And it's put into a large database in the district called DV Hydro. And Gary is one of the, the few guys I know that can whiz through that. It's more a spreadsheet just like that. You'll see that actually here. But also, Stuart Van Horn and the district staff do a great job in summarizing kind of some of these inputs. Here's Lake Okeechobee, over 358,000 acre feet, 30% uh, of our flow into the estuary, but a lot of metric tons, and, and what's blue there is the concentration, 174 parts per billion in phosphorus, and also about 1.57 uh, milligrams per liter in nitrogen, which is the, the TMDL is 0.72. So we're, we're you know, documenting, and we have documented over the years. This goes from 97 to 2017 of the flow of the phosphorus and nitrogen. So not only did this, he did this for each of the sub-watersheds, C44 Basin, C23, C24, and 10 Mile Creek, which are the four kind of major control basins with structures and controls. So, and he also quantified the top
title basin. I want you to notice that that, that words under there, it says title basin loads are calculated using model flows. They don't have a direct kind of structure to put a monitor there and say, what is the flow coming through that structure? They have to kind of model it through whatever the tributary is. We have over 28 to 35 different tributaries coming in, like Warner Creek, Kruger Creek, all these little creeks and, and tributaries coming into the St. Lucie. So it's pretty hard to monitor, but they do the best they can with the modeling and trying to come up with numbers and quantifications. So here's the big chart, and I don't want you to get too blind yeah. looking at this. But the, the one thing I want you to point out, of course, Lake Okeechobee at the top, it's, it's a very huge inflow. And the St. Lucie Basin is totally an inflow. But the tidal basin itself is one of the cleanest and the, the smallest inflows to the, to the system comparatively to the other basins. And they break out this whole St. Lucie watershed, meaning the, the 1.1 right there. So you've got a lot of flow, a lot of nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, uh, nitrogen, uh, or what you mean, and uh, nitrogen and nitrogen concentrations. So just don't get too confused with the data. Just know that it was well presented. The district did a great job. And that, yes, there's pollution coming to the rest of it. Um, Gary Goforth likes to put it a different way. These are from Gary. Uh, recently, you can see the kind of the pie charts up at the top where the flow is. This is the nitrogen loading, the phosphorus, and suspended salt. Remember the TSS I was talking about? So you can see the percentages. I know you can't read them too well. It's very dark. But the Lake of Okeechobee is about 37% of the flow. And this is what was last year. This is He does this annually. does it every year. And then you can see the coastal tributaries at 13%. And then the other four major basins. So he breaks it out very similar to the Stuart Van Horn district. Uh, but you can see this large pie shape here. That's from Lake Okeechobee. That's the total suspended solid. That's where we get all of our suspended solids and all that silt set and out. So these are another way to look at it as far as the percentage of land use and land cover. There's agricultural runoff that's the big portion of that pie along with Lake Okeechobee in blue, but you can see the very small natural lands or communities that are parts of that uh, loading to our estuary. And then this is the table, and just focus on the ones I put in the red box. You can see the Lake Okeechobee at, at over a million pounds of total nitrogen coming in, and 23 million pounds of total suspended solids, much larger than any other of the basins or any other tributaries. The same, but outlined as the coastal tributaries is very small comparatively in nitrogen and phosphorus loading for that. Lake Okeechobee and Ag Runoff are obviously the largest inflows into our system that contribute to total nitrogen, which is a is the factor in in estuaries and in saltwater is is nitrogen, not phosphorus. You hear them talk about phosphorus all the time in the Everglades limit, 10 parts per billion or in other natural water bodies like lakes and streams and rivers. But when you get to estuaries, you gotta start thinking about nitrogen. That's a real critical problem. Here's another way to here and look at it all the way back to 1980 on the far left, all the way to now. And this is kind of a five-year averaging mean. Uh, you can see the very big spikes and, and, and things that drive it, both the flows here in St. Lucie River estuary and the Clusatchee estuary. And then these are two for the phosphorus and nitrogen. Again, I don't want you to get too dizzy on numbers, but where he reaches here at this point, this five-year average from 2018, that matches really well with the district data and number. So he's taking five years back from 18 to, to more year 14, that kind of thing. So it matches that data. Now I want to end up with kind of talking about TMDLs and DNAP. You've heard about this. We set a total maximum daily load, a TMDL for the St. Lucie estuary in 2009. 2013, we adopted a BMAP, a Basin Management Action Plan. And I hate to bombard people with acronyms without explaining, but you pretty well get the idea. The Basin Management Action Plan idea was to say, take these 22 entities that are contributors to this watershed and have them understand their beginning or starting loads of nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and those pollutants that we're limiting that were calling for a total maximum daily load on that Roosevelt Bridge. So what they did was they calculated all those starting loads, and then they calculated the load reduction that needs to happen. And so we end up with a target load. So the starting load here for nitrogen is 
1.4 million pounds per year. We want to get it down to 1 million pounds per year, and this is a, a, a target about, I'm sorry, 1.1, and so this is a reduction that has to happen. So the VMAP process is a 15-year process. It started in 2013. The first phase is till 2018. <coughs> the last phase is till 2028. So we won't reach our TMDL to then, but how are we doing it? Here's the same thing kind of for phosphorus. And the top line is agriculture, which they put all together in one kind of big thing. You see Martin County, St. Lucie County, uh, city, you know, different cities and municipalities are dealing with the MS4, different different kind of stormwater projects in order to have to make the production. <coughs> the last thing I'm talking about here is what disappointing is to me, how in the first kind of segments they gave credits for the estimated load reductions by a BMP's 90% target sign up enrollment, and also an estimated load reduction target for land use changes. The agriculture argued that land use has changed since 2009, so we, they gave them credit of 197 pounds of nitrogen, 171,000 pounds of nitrogen, so they got a total credit, and if you take that from what your reduction was, you take that number, that number, you got a credit going into the next phase. So without doing much of anything, and I've asked them about 90% enrollment, and they had a presentation on, on best management practice, BMPs, and the best that agriculture can do with that is 25% reduction of all that kind of pollution. So we're, we're really going, giving them credits for not documented data and information, and that's where Gary and I and others say, let's use the data. We have the data going back years. Let's look at the data. If it's coming out in pollution levels, let's go upstream, find out where that's happening. So right now, the governor put out kind of an order in the beginning of his term in January and said, we really need to get these BMAPs updated. So they've accelerated this timeline for Calusa, Hatchie, St. Lucie, and Lake Okeechobee. And these are the meetings. In fact, uh, next week on Tuesday, there's a public meeting in July over in Okeechobee for the BMAP and, and, and accelerating that update. Then in August, they're going to have meetings and webinars for both all three, all two of them, and then all three in October, I'm trying to have a draft document by December in order to report back by January this coming year. Because they have one year to say, you got to update these meetings. We can't be waiting around. So you can see the extent of the watershed and what we've got to look for. This was presented by Tom Frick from the Department of Environmental Protection Tech. Tom was here as a representative of DEP at the time. And lastly, I kind of end with this. This was a great handout, that, which you saw actually last meeting. It has kind of all the projects and programs and, and things like that around those watersheds. Unfortunately, as Marty pointed out, it's not the, uh, not the Lake Worth Lagoon that I had to at this point. And this you might have seen before. These are the uh, projects and programs within our area. We fought real hard to include in the IRL South plan the, the green areas you see, Alapata, um, Cypress Creek, and Palmer. In fact, I remember Mark County Commission, and we gave a check for about 26 million in our Healthy Rivers uh, bond issue we raised to help help purchase the lands and get Alpata going. And we were the first local government to step up to the plate and put our money where our mouth is. So I applaud you.
so we'll move on to, uh, by the way, we'll have this PowerPoint. It'll be a PDF on the website of Zerbs Coalition. Yes. If you're wanting to go ahead and look at that. Um, we're going to hear from Martin County and then our state agencies, so particularly the Water Management District is here. So Diane Hughes. Oh, yes. Yeah. The microphone's right up there. You just have to talk. And it's kicking in. Good. Very good. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, just going to give you a little bit of an update where we're at today. Um, we are in the water shortage management ban. Um, I think today is it's 11.62, so we're at 11.53. Um, previous day, 11.52, and one week ago, 11.47. So um, there's about 78 CFS flowing out um, as of today from the lake, and 1,900 still coming into the system. <coughs> this is um, where we're at. You can see we're, we're very, very close. We're like almost right on the water shortage management band line. And then these are the predictions of where we might end up going for the rest of the year. This is the 50 percentile line right here, which just follows the water shortage management plan line. So you can see kind of what might happen. Um, this is a daily graphical plots that are put out from the S80. So you can see from the rain events that we've had in July, we have had some C44 basin flows um, up around, um, you know, sometimes around 800 CFS. We've had some flows come out of the C44 basin in the past couple of days. Uh, yesterday was almost 700 CFS, where we were down to around 218 CFS today. <clears throat> um, so you can see this, here's what's coming into the system right now, and on Monday, the um, lock operators at the S80 had noticed that they saw algae on the upstream side of the structure of S80, so after, you can see in this last, so on 26, the lock operators noticed that there was algae, and then we received the discharge, so that algae was likely delivered to us into the estuary. <clears throat> um, this is the amount of rain that we've had in the past seven days. Um, in the coastal Martin County, you know, not, not too much, not half an inch. Um, even though it's showing in the two inch rain here in the C44 basin, we, there was actually a maximum of five inches that we've had in the past um, five day, uh, seven days, so that's why we're receiving the C44 basin flows coming to us. <clears throat> Here we are um, for the Enterococcus levels of this week. We had a moderate condition at the Roosevelt Bridge. We've had some high levels, and then the resamples um, have come up good on these. So, the same week. Our mid salinity estuary is still looking really good. This is the daily mean salinity at, at 18, so it's up and down with the rains that we're receiving as well as the temperature. You see the temperature has actually come down a bit in the range that we see and then we're trying to go back up to the day. <clears throat> right here around 87, 88 degrees Fahrenheit. And then this is probably the same project update I had last week except for the fact that um, um, we have started our Jensen Beach and Conrad hydrological restoration that's currently underway. Um, these other projects I talked to you about last month and they're kind of still in the same steps. Next, we have the state federal agencies. Paul Gray is not able to be here to help update us, but we do have some Jackie for the district of governing board from the water district make a few announcements about things and introduce a few of our young people. Thank you. Great. Oh, wow. Check out this new mic. Very cool. Great. Thank you. So I'm Jackie Thurlow Lippish. No, do you just as Jackie Thurlow Lippish? There at Sewell's Point and all the other things. GTO. And you know, most recently I have um, become a member of the Water Management District. So my little presentation today is kind of a mixture of both. And um, I thought to myself um, how wonderful the River Kids program has been. And I thank uh, Mr. Geisinger for the donation today. And um, I thought, you know, the tension that we sense in the room, and I apologize for correcting you, gentlemen, is that we love our river. We love our river. And we have taught these young people 
how much we love our river since 2013. And the young lady to my left, you might remember, is Veronica Dalton. And Veronica Dalton, how old were you in 2013? I was 10. 10. <laughs> <laughs> so Veronica was 10 years old. You were a fourth too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> In, in 2013, and she got a call, and I sent her to Leon Abood, and I said, Leon, have this young woman, have this girl speak, um, and she showed up to speak, and Evan Miller had arranged that on Facebook, and there were over 5,000 people there. Well, she spoke, and so to say the least, this situation has had a huge effect on her life. So I just wanted to, her to say a couple of words. She's now um, a junior, right? How old you be a senior? Oh, sorry. She's going to be a senior <laughs> at, um, that's very important when you're that age, at um, South Fork in the International Baccalaureate Program, and she wants to study. Why don't you tell them what you want to study and just um, how you aren't afraid of public speaking in the club. <laughs>
which younger generation of young people are not are, are growing up and all that has happened that we have helped fight for is forming their lives and they will be better citizens um, helping to make a difference in the future so have a round of applause for all of us someone here who can speak much better than myself. And this is, this is Drew Bartlett, who is my, our executive director, and um, he is a force of nature, and I'd like you to welcome him and let him speak for a minute today.
very young when they start, just like these employees. I mean, it's really important that we get the next generation going and coupled with this effort. The next board meeting is, I think, August 8th, uh, but they're not having a workshop, as I understand, prior to that, so its focus is going to be on some other things there. But I know the continuation, like uh, Drew said, the governing board is really about the district. It is about uh, looking at water quality. So we really need to be there if we can. We can carpool. Uh, we can meet out, uh, you know, out at Cracker Barrel or something, and we can leave a car there and I'll go down one car so to save energy that way and do some stuff that way. So, Mark, Jack, do you have another update on this district? Yeah. The district has started these new programs called Lunch and Learns. Yep, here's one coming and, up. And um, anyone, everyone can partake in them. The board members partake in them with technology. We can all be in this together as we should be. And so uh, even though there's not the workshop, So the lunch and learns are coming up. Uh, this one is July 31st, which is next Wednesday, I believe. So be sure you can get on. You can even it's like a webinar. You can just click on. You can watch it, participate, uh, or you can attend. So I think that's a really good thing. We'll put it on the website so people know about these things coming up. The other thing, the state agencies are not here, but uh, DEP has, a, of course, the BMAP. I mentioned Lake Okeechobee BMAP coming up. That's next Tuesday. It's out in Okeechobee at the uh, Conference Center, Education Center in Okeechobee, Florida. So I'm planning to attend. Some of our other members are planning to attend. Again, that fast track of the BMAP. And then on August 1st, which is uh, uh, next week also, Thursday, is the uh, you know blue, uh, blue Green Algae Task Force. And that meeting is very close by. It's right up at Harbor Branch uh, Oceanographic up the road here at Fort Pierce. So I encourage everybody to attend. Uh, these are the five members of the task force. Uh, they're, they're very informed people. A lot of them are local. Uh, uh, you know, Valerie Paul is the director at Smithsonian. I've known Wendy Graham when she was at the Water Institute, University of Florida, uh, who was also in 2013 when, when remember, Senator Negron time to ask for that study. Uh, so she's very savvy. Jim Sullivan is the director up there in Harbor Branch. Uh, Parsons from over in Gulf Coast University. And, and so Florida International, and so I, I really encourage you, they have some really good meetings, and if you, they have a good website, you can go back to their other meetings. This will be, I guess, the third, uh, uh, third one they're having. And they're really, they're really focused discussions, and they encourage input, too. So let's have to attend to that. That starts at uh, 9 o'clock. It's 9 to 3 on August 1st, Thursday, August 1st. Is that going to be webcast? Um, I think it is, yeah. Each one of them are. Yeah, are yeah, for, there's flyers on the back table. There's the website, and there's information. Thank you, Barbara, on that. Lastly, on the Corps of Engineers, I talked to Lieutenant Colonel Reynolds. Uh, uh, she appreciated being here last time, but she couldn't be. She mentioned her, her predecessor is going to be Todd Polk, P O L K, and Todd is going to be her replacement that will be traveling around uh, this next month. 